overview of my presentation, I want to say a little bit about the importance of to, to link problem theory, preservation of technology and stakeholders issues. I will say a little bit on that. And I will give two examples in which I will um, illustrate that how important I think that all of these issues are important when we come from a certain problem and we want to implement a certain solution in which we use, make use of digital uh, health technology. The first is an uh, informal care ITN uh, project and uh, the second one is about fatigue and cancer. Okay, um, let me see. Okay, um, last month I was in Bilbao. You have the nice um, Guggenheim Museum out there, but I was in a different museum also there, and there I took a picture of this uh, triptych, and I sort of will misuse it to say a little bit about uh, some of the key concepts. Um, so I think if we see a certain problem in healthcare and we want to solve that, it's very important to make a good anal analysis. And in doing so, it's very much important, of course, to make use of already existing knowledge uh, from science, but also to involve theory in it. I think that quite often people go from a certain problem, jumping to a conclusion, making a, a nice app or coming up with, with a guideline, but it's very important also make, to make use, to, to make a real good analysis by using theory. So that's one of the pillars uh, also uh, to say. Um, and then the other thing is, I think if we work on, if we come to the conclusion that from our analysis we want to come up with um, uh, ICT solutions, then it's very important not to only look at the sort of hardware part only, but also look very much into the design issues. So we have to be very persuasive in how we present the digital health uh, things. And then the third and very important issue is uh, um, uh, to involve all kinds of stakeholders. So social workers, patients, doctors, uh, politicians, uh, so um, because Especially when we have when we have a nice solution, and you were telling telling them some stuff on that in Scotland as well, then how to implement that? And it's so important to involve uh, all kinds of stakeholders to um, to get to a good result. So about digital health, I think uh, Donald also t touched on on that. We have to do with aging population. The healthcare costs are rising, like in the Netherlands in the 60s, last century, we had three cents per euro we, we paid for healthcare, and now it's all, all, all around 14, 15 cents per euro. So it's rising and rising. And quite often a lot of people with chronic disease are too distant to the hospital, so there it's very interesting to make use of all kinds of e-health, m-health uh, uh, issues. And I think I'm particularly also very in favor of using blended care, where there is still this relationship and contact uh, with uh, the medical doctor or uh, social worker, but also some um, helping out with, with using uh, digital uh, issues. Now, uh, in a recent overview, we could find that there was over 300,000 health apps on the, on, on the internet but only 512 research reports. So a lot of the things which are out there are not tested at all. So, uh, and I think that's a very important issue that we're going to work on that um, in evaluating whether it's helpful. Okay, let's start with a problem. I want you to read this and to look into that whether you are yourself a caregiver, an informal caregiver. So an informal caregiver is someone who does something to a, near, uh, a close one without getting paid, and these are sort of tasks you normally wouldn't do for this person. So if you have a read there. So are you caring for a loved one who belongs one of the categories below? So being disabled, have an illness, maybe as going to die soon. Okay, uh, maybe you will raise your hand if you're one of those, please. So, few hands. So it's, it's remarkable. I will show some, um, because it's, I can tell you it's a bigger problem than in this group at least. Uh, in the Netherlands, for example, almost 30% of the population is an informal caregiver. 
and um, <clears throat> uh, so that that's a lot of people and who are informal caregivers interestingly also a lot of male are in, in this category it's uh, young and old people and as you can see which is interesting um, it's quite often a lot of time people devote to the informal care uh, uh, tasks so and I think in addition to a lot of the problems we have in the in the healthcare system I think this is also something which needs uh, time and um, with the um, w what you can see across a lot of countries there is what we can call a care gap so we have uh, a rising of the aging population whereas we do not have more younger people who can help help out so this is a real problem and we asked ourselves as a research team the following questions um, are people still able and willing to provide care to a loved one in the future so that was the first question and we were also interested in the role of family norms culture but also individual differences and care situations in the willingness to to give care and the 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 further question was also how can we support carers so if if this is a problem to uh, can we support carers in one way or another and we thought about the use of digital health um, now what we did was the following we we wrote a grant and we were very lucky to get this grant from the EU uh, it's so-called ITN Marie Curie project uh, with the name of Entwine um, and so we do this project with five countries and in total we have 15 PhD students and we can work on this problem of informal care and uh, possible solutions it's, uh, you can find it on, uh, on the internet, Entwine uh, ITN EU. Um, so when you get so much money, uh, you first go going to celebrate. So this is my, uh, the co-PI uh, and me. Um, the, the two of us are, uh, are coordinating this project. But then the following day we had to start to work. And we have in the project three work packages. Willingness to care, so that's the more basic theoretical Thing, uh, to know more about informal care and the willingness, you know, innovative solutions, so start to think about solutions and also implementations of solutions. And in each work package we have five PhD students. Now the first work package is willingness to care, so there we want to, want to see more about challenges and motivations for diverse groups of informal caregivers and also to look into that in different countries in different care systems. Now we have, so we're looking into also economic uh, issues and all kinds of cross-cultural differences. But um, as an example of one of the five PhD students in this group is, is in Groningen, Julia, and she's looking into the more caregiving care recipient diets. So in the patients together with the informal caregiver, quite often the, pair, the, the partner. And to look into the dynamics in the uh, system of the diet and to learn from that and um, well this is also integrated in a cohort study we're going to do across 10 countries to see where we can see uh, uh, cultural differences between countries and can learn from these uh, differences and uh, helping out uh, for uh, starting innovations so this second work package also with five PhD students is on innovative solutions for example we have in in, in Glasgow, we have um, we do something with social robotics, so that's very tech thingy. But we also try to make uh, new e-health apps. Um, and well, a key question is also how uh, best to deliver such interventions to sustain willingness to care. Now, an example of such a project is again a student we have in Groningen, um, and she works on balancing caregiving and e-health applications to support decision making so this is a program which will help informal caregivers who are caring for a loved one who is in a palliative, palliative phase of their disease and uh, some of the questions she will address is um, do different caregivers have different needs and wish to respect to the design features and uh, how should we design it to be persuasive persuasive and also to see whether there's cross-cultural uh, features need to be considered. So, um, 
And I think this is also timely because if we find certain trends, then we can easily upscale to different countries or we have to take into account the, the differences in the different countries. So the third work package is on um, implementation. And um, here we really make use of already existing uh, uh, technology to, to do implement, implementation. Um, so an example of this is uh, Leva. She's doing a, a project, she works in Sweden, but we do the project in Lithuania uh, on uh, helping out caregivers with an e-health uh, CBT uh, project where the, the, this is blended care. So there is a therapist in the office which helps out through the internet. And uh, we use an existing platform. Uh, Why Lithuania? It's a country with a very rapid aging of the population. There's a huge shortage of psychological help, and, uh, but uh, they have an ex excellent uh, internet system. So we're going to test there whether this will work. Now, this is the whole consortium. Uh, so it's also talking about stakeholders has to do with companies, um, also governmental organizations, etc. Okay, now the second problem uh, is um, on fatigue and cancer. And um, um, you may know that, or may not know, that cancer-related fatigue is a very huge problem, and even a bigger problem in, in patients with cancer in the aftermath after diagnosis and treatment than, uh, for example, anxiety and depression. Now, uh, this, so this is a, a very important uh, side effect of the cancer and cancer treatment. And um, together with some other people, we thought, well, we might try uh, with an e-health program to support people. There is, um, the options are limited to, to support people. I mean, uh, and so they came up with the idea of an app based on face-to-face um, -face therapy. So it's, it's really um, the entire app is a standalone app, so you don't have a therapist uh, there. Uh, you can work with it yourself. And um, it is uh, meant to lower the cancer-related fatigue. And it's, as I said, it's really based on face-to-face -face therapy principles of mindfulness and CBT. And we did an international study in four countries. And uh, this, <coughs> this is the flow of the study. And the key things are that we had a lot of participants. And uh, as you can see, with technology, th three, four, uh, about 75% downloaded the app. So even when they commit to a study and they get this app for nothing, uh, still a lot of people even don't use it. So this is something with technology. The dropout is always an issue, and we uh, should work on that. So uh, we didn't find any differences between the, the two conditions at baseline, so that's, that's nice because then you can test the two groups. Um, females, most of the time it's females. That's also in face-to-face -face therapy. We see uh, many more females than males quite often. And we this, this, did this in English-speaking countries. Um, and it's interesting to see the 9.4% of people who receive professional help for fatigue. So there's a huge group who are ex experiencing problems and also get to above our cutoff for fatigue problems so that they could get into trial who didn't receive uh, any help. Um, so I will quickly give some results. So you see that the control group goes down. but. Uh, Happy go lucky. We found that the intervention group um, was significantly better off on um, fatigue severity after 12 weeks, and we see that also with the interference uh, on on fatigue. Um, now we were also interested, and we did this in, with an intention to treat model, but we were also interested whether if people would use the app, whether that would make a difference. Now you see the control group here. You see here the people who got into the trial but didn't download the app, so they were not active uh, in the program. Then we had a group who did download the app but didn't use it very much, so or hardly. And then we had this group who um, had a sort of a medium use of the app throughout the trial, which do better. And then this was the group um, 
who made a, a lot of use of it. And we see that again with fat fatigue severity, but also with fatigue interference. So it, if, you, if you use the app, then you see quite a difference on these uh, problems. Um, so what's here? So we could uh, conclude this, and, and we're almost done with writing up the main paper of this uh, study. Uh, we did this together with a company who developed the app, but who are, have a background in psychology and, and, and clinical work. Um, so I come back to the triptych and then I stop. Uh, uh, so I think it's very important always if you are confronted or you're interested in a certain problem in healthcare, um, please look at evidence please look into theories which can guide our analysis of the problem and not jump to an easy conclusion and come up with a solution you think is best. Then, if we talk about uh, technology, it's so important to look into the design features, the persuasiveness, etc. So, um, because even in this app we, we studied, we see a lot of people who drop out, who do not use such an app, so it's still, we have still a, a long way to go to get uh, technology to such a level that uh, people are uh, going to uh, stay in such programs. And the third thing is always have stakeholders on board from the early beginning, like analyzing the problem, making the digital tools, also with implementation. So that's always a thing uh, which is important to take into your mind. Um, I show this one not to make, yeah, it's a bit of um, I'm, I'm a co-editor of this book. It's on e-health research theory and development. I think it's a very nice book, of course. I don't earn a, money, a penny when you buy it, and so, but it might be helpful if you're in this, this area of research. Okay, that's it. Okay.